Welcome to the University of New Hampshire School of Law podcast, where every week our professors give legal insight on important news topics. Learn more about the law school by visiting law.unh.edu. Today we are with Professor John Graby to discuss the recent Supreme Court decision on internet sales tax. Please note, opinions discussed are solely the opinion of the faculty or host and do not constitute legal advice or necessarily represent the official views of the University of New Hampshire. To start off with, what was the basis for South Dakota versus Wayfair Inc., the internet retailer? Well, it it began as a lawsuit um, by South Dakota to collect uh, sales tax on out-of-state retailers uh, that were doing business uh, in certain volumes with uh, with residents of South Dakota. Um, the, uh, the litigation was really an attempt to challenge uh, some old precedent, which held that you cannot collect a sales tax from a retailer unless that retailer has some sort of physical presence within a state, within a jurisdiction. Um, This was an effort by South Dakota to collect a sales tax from Wayfair and a couple other similar uh, companies that do a lot of business uh, through the internet. Um, uh, Because uh, in situations where um, uh, you, where you can't collect a sales tax from an out-of-state retailer, um, it is incumbent under South Dakota law for for purchasers to pay what's called a use tax. But um, the reality is that that very few people do that. So for a long time, states with sales tax have been looking to overturn this precedent so that they can collect, sa- they can you know actually enlist out-of-state retailers doing business with their residents in the process of collecting sales tax, just the same way that that in-state brick-and-mortar retailers do. I'm kind of surprised it took this long. You figured this would have happened 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. Well, these old precedents were established in the context of out of state businesses that did business through the mail. Um, and those were, uh, you know, and, and that was the context where the Supreme Court said, no, you know, we're not going to make those types of businesses collect your sales tax and remit it to the state. Um, and this, be, this case be, uh, was an occasion to revisit those old precedents and ultimately to overturn them. And how exactly did the Supreme Court rule about this? Well, what it did is it overturned these precedents um, and held that so long as other constitutional requirements are satisfied, there is no constitutional barrier uh, to states having out-of-state retailers participate in the sales tax collection process. Um, and so um, South Dakota had passed a law saying that out-of-state retailers that did, um, I, th- I think it was over 200 individual transactions per year with South Dakota. Dakota residents or did over $100,000 per year in business with South Dakota residents now needed to collect South Dakota sales tax and remit it to the state. Um, That law uh, was held to be constitutional. And along the way, the court, again, overturned two of its older precedents uh, that would have made that law unconstitutional. This screams states' rights to me. It's like, does this have any... uh does the conservative leaning of the court have any impact on this? Yeah, it was interesting to see. Uh, it was a 5-4 decision. Uh, the five justices in the majority thought that the, you know, the precedents were sufficiently out of touch, out of date. Not, I mean, not out of date, but just wrong, uh, that they it warranted overturning them. I mean, the court doesn't always overturn precedents with which it disagrees. There's a doctrine known as stare decisis that provides stability in the law uh, and sometimes dictates that the court will not not revisit old precedents, even though it might disagree with those precedents. The four justices uh, who dissented in this case uh, actually agreed with the majority that the old precedents were were not soundly decided, but they were just concerned about the effect of overturning these precedents. They said this should have been left to Congress to do. Do we expect this to fuel a lot more lawsuits on state levels for exactly how things are collected and the nature of, I mean, this is there's 50 states. There's a lot of different uh, impacts. There are. Yeah. And, and what's, what's really interesting is like, we, you know, we, we're here in New Hampshire, which is actually one of the few states that doesn't have a sales tax. This decision is being very well received by most states. Over 40 states do have sales tax and they haven't been able to enlist out of state retailers in the process of collecting those sales taxes. So they've been foregoing, you know, millions and millions of dollars of revenue per year um, because, again, uh, customers don't pay use taxes. Um, you, you know, obviously the reaction locally here in New Hampshire has been very, very negative because New Hampshire doesn't have a sales tax. This isn't going to bring 
any money into state coffers, but it is going to affect retailers in New Hampshire who do business out of state um, and now are, you know, at least constitutionally subject uh, to being required to participate in those states sales tax collection mechanisms. Was there any discussion regarding this for the impact this is going to have on smaller retailers? Well, there, you know, it, there is going to be more litigation because, again, the South Dakota statute didn't apply to all retailers. It didn't apply to, you know, a, a retailer that just does a couple of transactions a year uh, with South Dakota does under $100,000 worth of business. Um, there is this multi-prong test that the Supreme Court has come up with um, that is going to be applied in the future. So the question is going to be, um, you know, our, our de minimis contacts with out of state uh, is that going to be enough under the Constitution to make you know a retailer uh, have to you know register and, and again participate in this process? Um, I suspect that uh, states aren't going to uh, attempt to uh, you know to enlist everybody who does any transaction, um, but if they do, um, that will be challenged as uh, you know as an undue burden on interstate commerce. Yeah, for those who don't know, I mean, Wayfair is an enormous company. I mean, they're a competitor to Amazon and the Walmarts, the Amazons, the Wayfairs are going to have to make some serious changes in order to compensate for this. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, so um, I would expect for the litigation, I think that the law is going to further develop. Um, you know, to to establish, you know, uh, probably as a constitutional matter, some sort of minimum amount of business that an out of state retailer does before it becomes, you know, uh, before a state can subject it to its, uh, 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 you know, to its to these these uh, these tax collection uh, rules. You kind of brought it up already, but New Hampshire doesn't have a sales tax. Uh, it's kind of a unique situation for us. Um, it is already causing conflict with the legislature where they refuse to really make a decision on what they're going to do with it to the disdain of the governor. Yeah, the governor's frustrated. Um, you know, the Senate was frustrated with the House. They decided to table it, as I understand it. I just t- you know, took a quick quick look at the news this morning. Um, I mean, here the problem that they face is this. Um, the Supreme Court has has said that it is constitutional now, uh, at least in certain circumstances, for states uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to make retailers doing business with their own residents uh, to collect a sales tax. Um, insofar as New Hampshire wants to protect its retailers from having to participate in that, um, it is bringing New Hampshire law into conflict with the law of other states. Um, there are constitutional problems with that. Um, the Constitution contains a Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause gives Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce. That grant of power to Congress has been construed as also placing a limit on states in terms of their ability to discriminate against interstate commerce or otherwise impose an undue burden on interstate commerce. This is, all my students will moan when they hear this, but this is the famous Dormant Commerce Clause doctrine. Um, insofar as New Hampshire interferes, let Let's say that there's a retailer in New Hampshire, just hypothetically, you know, that does five million dollars a year of business with Massachusetts customers. Um, Massachusetts wants to collect sales tax. Massachusetts has a sales tax. If New Hampshire seeks to protect that retailer from having to comply with Massachusetts law, um, that is or or at least Massachusetts would argue that would be interference with interstate commerce uh, in a way that you know, under established Supreme Court precedents uh, could be deemed to violate um, the Constitution, violate this this so-called Commerce Clause doctrine. There's also another uh, part of the Constitution, Article 4 of the Constitution, uh, which contains a full faith and credit clause and a privileges and immunities clause. And that was initially put in the Constitution precisely to deal with interstate warfare back, at, you know, under the Articles of Confederation, which was, you know, those were our, that was our initial Constitution before the Constitution was ratified. One of the big reasons why we, we created the Constitution and ratified it it is because the states weren't playing nice with one another. They were imposing tariffs on each other. They were engaged in protectionist legislation. Um, and so Article 4 said basically states have to respect each other's laws, okay, and they have to treat out-of-state persons, and corporations are, are people too, my friend, <laughs> as you may know, they have to treat them the same way that they treat in-state uh, 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 interests and persons. Um, and so it's 
kind of hard as I sit here to think about what New Hampshire could do to protect New Hampshire retailers who are doing business out of state um, from having to comply with the laws of the state where they are doing business. And I'd imagine if it's not handled correctly, New Hampshire is going to get sued by other states. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's there's huge money at stake. Um, and, you know, I'm again, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a problem because the states do not have uniform taxation policies, you know, and so under this decision, money only flows out of the state of New Hampshire. It does not flow in. Um, and that's because New Hampshire doesn't have a sales tax. Thank you for listening to the show. Get the back episodes at law.unh.edu slash podcast, which also has links to subscribe to the show and all your favorite podcast services, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and now Spotify. Talk to you next Thursday. Opinions discussed are solely the opinion of the faculty or host and do not constitute legal advice or necessarily represent the official views of the University of New Hampshire.